Welcome to the second session of our Academy on Computers. Our resident expert, Jim Butterfield, is back with us, and our topic is ready-made programs. But first, Jim, I'd like to ask about the whole issue of software compatibility. Now, in our last program, you took the computer apart and showed me the innards, and you explained about computers being made up of a electronic circuits that are either on or off, all right? That's right. Okay. Now, if this structure is the same for all computers, why do we have a software compatibility problem? Okay, that's a good question, Jack. But I should mention, first of all, that many people who write software, what we call the software houses, do write many programs, many versions of their programs, so that you can find a version which fits your particular machine. But the reason they have to write so many versions is because computers, even though they're all ones and zeros, bits and bytes, on and off, they still have their differences. Now, to explain those differences, I should talk about the way that we organize the computer's storage, or its memory, as we call it. When the computer calls up some information from its memory, it calls it up by a number. It may say, I want the contents of location 5,000. I want the location of location, contents of location 12,000, that sort of a thing. What we call that is an address in memory, and we say in each address there'll be a byte of information. Now, when the computer goes after that, it will get its information, of course, but different computers keep their information in different places. So that, for example, if I pick one computer, it might be keeping certain kinds of information, perhaps a program you've typed in at address 5,000 in its memory. And then if I went over to a different computer and looked at that same address, 5,000, I might not find anything there at all because the computer is organized differently. We say it has a different architecture. That's one reason, because computers then are laid out differently internally, that we can't just walk a program from one to another. But there are perhaps some more important reasons behind it than that. For example, each computer has special features, so that one computer might have graphics, it might have sound, it might have joysticks, it might have all sorts of special things that the next computer doesn't have. Now, if you write a program using all of these wonderful features, the graphics and or the sound of the joysticks, what will happen is that program will work fine on the computer you wrote it for, but you take it over to another computer that doesn't have color, doesn't have sound, or at least not the same kind of sound, you're going to have some real problems getting that program working. So that's the second reason. There's a third reason, and it's almost the most trivial of the whole bunch, but it's the one that gives people the most trouble at the beginning. Let me take a cassette tape. There's a there's a program written on this cassette tape, but it was written on a certain computer. It was written on a TRS-80, and the various bits that make up the program are stored as a series of frequencies. Squawks, if you like, beeps and bites, if you want to think about it that way. So what we have now is the TRS-80 recognizes that the moment you bring it in because it knows the frequencies that are there. But if I tried to put this program into a pet, the pet is tuned to hear different frequencies, and it can't even detect anything on this tape. It wouldn't make any sense at all to a pet. So we have the simple difficulties of many of our storage devices have differences in formats. Now, with all of these differences, is it possible then to transport programs at all? Well, I'd be misleading you if I said that's not possible. There are many systems whereby you can exchange information between computers. And one quite popular one is called CPM. That stands for Control Program Microprocessor. And I have here in the studio... Uh, one side and the other side, two different computers which happen to use this system called CPM. There are many, many more, although the most popular computers that we've been talking about in the past often don't seem to have this feature. But here we have an Osborne microcomputer, and it uses CPM. And what that means is a computer is organized in a certain way with its memory carefully placed in certain locations, and it works its input-output devices in a certain way, its disk and its screen and whatever. And that's going to be the same as other makes of computers that use CPM. So there is some compatibility. So this there's some compa compatibility. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. right, and what that means then is that I can take a program written on the Osborne that we just looked at, and I can transfer it over to the Nelmer Persona computer, and there's a very good chance that that program will work right away with little or no corrections or changes or anything like that, because it's a machine with the same internal structure, as we say, the same architecture in that computer. So we do have that compatibility, but now we have to come down to the real decision. If you want compatibility, then you can get a system such as CPM, and programs then will transport between one computer and the other. What runs on one will probably run on the other. 
But on the other hand, we might say, look, I want to use all of these special features that microcomputers give me. I want to use the color. I want to use the sound. I want to use the joysticks. I want to use all of these special features that are on this computer. At that time, if we went for standardization, we might throw away these advantages. So you sacrifice versatility then with some compatibility. Right. A current. standard can hold you back. And right. that's one of the things we all have to design, d right. to decide for ourselves. Do we want to have a simple computer, mm -hmm. which is a standard computer, but can't necessarily do terribly exciting things, or do we want to have, to get the last ounce of our, out of our computer and use special features? Because if we use those special features, you've got to realize you just can't get compatibility with, with other machines. All right, Jim, that clears up some things about compatibility. My other question is, how does a program get into the computer? Okay, well, there are three ways. Now, the method that we have seen, first of all, uh, is bringing a program into RAM, the random access memory of the computer. You've seen people typing in programs. You've seen programs loaded from tape or disk. And these are the various ways of bringing a program into RAM. Let me talk about these for a moment. Here's a cassette tape. Its information is recorded magnetically. When you bring in something from the cas cassette tape, it's transferred to the random access memory, the RAM of the computer, and that's where the program stays. You just have a copy in RAM, and that's how it works. Exactly the same thing happens to a program which is stored on a floppy disk. This is our floppy disk, and when we bring the floppy disk in and we put the contents of the floppy disk into our computer, it, of course, once again goes into RAM, and it's stored there. Now, there's a third way that we can put programs into RAM, and this one is fairly popular, but it's a bit more work than the others, we can take programs as listed in a book or a magazine, and we can take these programs, read them out of the book, type them on the keyboard. We have, for example, games here. Here's another one that contains scientific and statistical programs. Here's another one that contains a huge payroll program. And you can type all of those things in. Some of them will take quite a little while. Now, if you did type program in that way, chances are very good that you wouldn't want to turn your machine and come back and have to type it work today. So what you do after typing, you'd say, guess what? Disk or tape. Now well, that's only first of the three categories. We've talked about bringing programs into RAM. There are two other methods that we have. One thing is, for example, we have our um, we have our BIM logic in the computer. The moment you turn a computer on, it already knows something. And that information is stored in ROM. It's built in. But the other way is that we have we can plug extra logic into the machine. This is called a ROM pack, but it's probably a better the proper name for it is because, for example, this one contains not only ROM, new logic for the computer, but RAM, extra storage for the computer. Let me see if I can take this one apart here. There's a little screw hole in the back here, and if I can loosen this up properly, and see, okay, we'll be able to take a look at the circuit board on the inside. And if I can't, well, we're going to have a little trouble looking here. Uh, just a second. I'm having trouble getting this one apart here. But that would change the whole logic board. It would change the, the, the circuit board in your computer. Look yes, in fact, board. it is a circuit board itself. What's right. inside this thing is more circuits, exactly the same as you saw on the computer yesterday. Here we go. We have it right here. Here is a ROM board, and as you can see, these are the connections that plug into the computer, and when it's plugged in, you have a computer with new logic, new information. There's a ROM with new logic. There's a RAM with extra storage. Now, I think I can show you an example of three different kinds, built in, loaded in, and plugged in with, with some of the machines that we have over in the studio here. Would you do that, Jim? All right, going to show us one kind of program and how it gets into a computer in different ways. What program is it? Some people don't call it a program, Jack. This is the actual part of the computer that makes the basic language itself work. Basic is a very popular language for writing programs in. But to make basic happen in a computer, we have to put inside the computer the logic to make the computer understand basic. Now, on the first computer we have here, a Commodore PET, basic is built in. So if you turn on the machine, you'll immediately have basic there. How does that happen? It's built in. It's in the ROM of the machine. Let's walk down and take a look at our second machine. Here we have an Apple II Plus. Once again, the moment you turn this machine on, it knows basic. Why? Because it's built in. It's part of the ROMs. We have a contrast when we walk to our third machine here. Here we have the IBM personal computer. And this machine doesn't know BASIC when you turn it on. Instead, BASIC must be brought into the machine. How do you do that? It comes into RAM by means of either being loaded from a floppy disk here or from a cassette tape. But it's not when you start up. 
you actually have to call BASIC in. Moving to our next machine, we see the third way that a program can come into the computer, in this case, the BASIC language. This Atari 800 doesn't know BASIC in the moment it's turned on, but I can plug BASIC in. Here's how I do it. I open up the cover. We can plug the BASIC into the inside of the machine. We now have a ROM in place, and now the machine understands BASIC. What we've seen here is the BASIC language. And that, of course, is something which is rather special and rather useful in the machine. But all programs follow the same rules. There are only three ways to get them into your computer. Method number one, it's built in. Method number two, you plug it in. Method number three, you listen or type it in, and then that goes into RAM. Thanks very much, Jim. Next, our four studio guests will be discussing ready-made programs. Attention Academy participants, before each viewing of Bits and Bytes, we suggest that you read the program description in part two of your participant's guide. After watching the program, read the corresponding chapter in the Bits and Bytes resource book and fill up the questions at the end of each chapter. Then check your understanding of the subject matter through the self-test in the participant's guide and you'll be ready to explore the subject matter in the correspondence connection. And now back to the Academy. Our guests in the studio are four people who use the computers every day. We have an instructional computing specialist, an editor, teacher, consultant, a lawyer, and an educator consultant. Let's see what they can tell us about ready-made programs. Good. I'd like to ask, start out by asking all of our guests the same question. What makes a good program? Sue? I think a good program is what does things the way you want to. For example, if you write 30 or 40 checks a month and you want to to balance your checkbook, it's no good getting one that will only balance ten checks. David? I think it should be non-intrusive. It shouldn't force you to change your way of doing business. And I think yes. also should use the full range of the computer's capacity. Lou? It's a type of program that uh, you should be able to screen, get all your instructions, yes. and be able to manipulate the keyboard, key in whatever you want, without having to refer to your user's manual. Good. All right. The program should match the level of expertise of the operator. Good. Okay, I'd like to throw this question out. Suppose you wanted to buy a computer system. What would you look for first? Would you look for the programs first, or would you look for the computer system as the hardware first? Which one? Well, I'm not a very technical person, and I know the kinds of things that I want to do with the computer. I want to informate, manage information, and I want to use the word processor to write all my Christmas letters and things like that. So I'm going to go out and look for programs first, and then the machine that will let me do on those programs that can help me. What do you think, David? Well, I definitely think you've got to look at the software first, but also you've got to look at the capacity of the hardware and measure up which one does a better job, because most of them can handle most of the software that's available. Okay. Suppose you don't know anything at all about programming. Would it be worthwhile then to go out and get a computer? If you knew nothing at all about programming, you weren't a programmer, still a good idea to get a computer or not? I think so, because there are enough packages on the map now that if you shop around, you can find something for just about everything that you want to do. I, I don't know that everybody agrees with me on that, but... What do you think? I agree with her totally. Well, I disagree, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me put it this way. If you don't know programming, you go to buy a computer, that's fine. But I don't think you should be dependent upon prepackaged uh, programs and things like that. The thing is that there's a method of thinking in computers, there's a method of thinking in, in programming. And if you learn that, then you are no longer going to be the victim of experts like myself or other people in this panel. Okay, wonderful. What, David, while you're making sense, I don't agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, I think wanting to know a bit about programming or, or insisting that one knows about programming is regressive. Because that's perhaps one of the great elements that turns people off computers. I maintain that you really don't have to know anything about programming. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a negative aspect for many people. They should be able to go out, you've identified your needs, you should be able to go out and buy the hardware, buy the software, implement your needs onto that system. I agree. I think one is a passive and one is an active way of interacting with a computer, and you can interact it with it most appropriately passively. Whether you choose to be creative and active, I, I think is up to the individual. Well, I look upon programming as I look upon my sex life, and I'd much rather have it active rather than passive, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, fine. But if you wanted to go out and get a program, what kind of a choice do you have? What kind of programs can you get? Tari? I think there are two types that I see now, 
and they tend to be either reactive software or creative software. And by that I mean the reactive one is that the computer shoots you a question or some kind of a demand some kind of a yes no response. Um, the other way is that you can have some kind, of input, some kind of creative personal input and make the program a little more uh, personal. Is that an educational view, Tony? That's an educational view, yes it is. Okay, Lou, you're a business person. Tell us about uh, what you might look for in a program. What kind of programs you can get? Well, there's a whole series of programs that are available for the business environment, uh, ranging from very, very specialized types of programs that would allow one to run a, a law office, um, a medical practice, a dental practice, uh, an architectural practice, uh, right through to a transportable type of program that would not only involve uh, uh, professionals, but would also involve any business applications, such as uh, a general accounting application, um, any of the spreadsheet programs, such as VisiCalc or, or SuperCalc, where in fact you can take a whole bunch of information, put it into the program, manipulate that information, see what the result is of that manipulation, look at cash analysis forecasts and, and budget plans and, and applications of that nature. Okay, so there's a lot of things you can do, but everybody's talking serious programs. Now I want you to come quick. Do any of you secretly, openly play games on your co serious computers? So. Well, when nobody's looking and I'm really tense and I've just come out of a furious meeting, I run into my office and I load sneakers into my computer and 15 or no, 20 minutes of that and I come back down to earth and can go on in a normal way. How about you, David? Well, I work very hard at Preppy, which in involves sending a Preppy across a golf course, which is answered by mad lawnmowers across the river with alligators in it to recover golf balls. Oh, wonderful. Lou is a serious business person. I don't suppose you play games. Well, I've got to be honest, Jim. You know, backgammon is one of my uh, problems on, on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like a serious problem. Terry, how about you? <laughs> yes, golf happens to be my favorite, actually. I think just as we have a certain kind of reading material that's serious, we also have a certain kind of reading material that's entertaining. I think we see a parallel with the computer. Let's talk a little more about games. Is there too much emphasis on games? Tari? I think we have to view the computer as a holistic entity. It's not only an imparter of knowledge, it's also going to be an imparter of, of entertainment, of, of an emotional gratification. And I think that's going to be the view of the computer in the future. And I'd, so I don't think there's too much emphasis on games at the present time. Lou, what do you Jim, I, I hold the view that games are a super introduction to the, uh, to the use of the computer for a novice. It's a way of, of relieving the fear of the keyboard, the re re relief of the, um, or fear of relieving the, the screen imagery that one gets. Uh, it's, it's a way of getting a response with very little effort, and I think it's just a super way to, to get someone that's never worked with a computer before to get them into it and start working with it. Yeah, but both of you are actually saying that although we enjoy games, we should feel a bit guilty about it. I mean, you can learn from games. Sure, there's a kind of game which is written by a 16-year-old retired ape calls shooting down all the aliens around you, and they're very aggressive kind of things. But there are games coming along now which are building an experience of how to use the joystick, how to use the screen, how to use the entire resources of the computer. These are serious adventure games, for example. There are games which I c think can go into historical simulation, and they're going to be one heck of a lot of fun. And I think, in fact, we're ignoring the fact of learning through play. And the game gives you a gorgeous introduction to that. I don't, I don't feel guilty about it. I don't think it's a matter that I we've got the grave thing on one side and the entertainment on the other. What do you I think? I, well, I, I, I think um, even the arcade games have some value. I was always very, very anti-games until a few months ago. I wanted to see what this business was all about. So I took a couple of different computers home and played Star Wars, Space Invaders, and Sneakers as I did before. And I found that in order to play those games well, I had to be very relaxed and concentrate. And that's almost the kind of skills you need when you're an athlete. It really quite surprised me. And it's something that we don't do very often, learn to relax and, and enjoy ourselves. Okay, now when we talk about computer programs, some of them are very inexpensive, some of them are very costly, some of them are even free. Is it true you get what you pay for, or is there some sort of a value judgment you make in, in getting programs? Do you get what you pay for? In so many respects, you do get what you pay for. If you pay 15 or $20 for a program, you're not going to get the same amount of thought and effort in it as if you pay $500 for a program. But within each range of program, you have to look very carefully at what you're buying just because something's cheap doesn't necessarily mean that it's no good. No, I don't agree. I mean, it's a real knee-jerk department store reaction. First of all, there are programs which you can get for about 15 or $20, which do the job a $200 program will do. 
In fact, Lou, you'll back me up on this, there was a guy in one of the computer magazines recently put out a program which was every bit as good as a professional program and he printed it in the magazine, so you got it for the cost of the magazine. Lou, are you going to back David up on that? I'm going to back him. I'm not going to fight with him on this one. He's absolutely right. The, the program was there. It, it, all it required was the user to take it and put it into the computer. And if a user sat down and spent the two or three uh, days required you know, to do that, he would end up with a program that would compare very favorably to anything that you could buy off the shelf in the vicinity of four to five hundred dollars, but a user is kind of suspicious. I find, if if it's free or or if it's you know budgetarily low, he, he's suspicious of it, and I don't know that that's the right approach. Quite Jim, frankly, we have three educators on the panel. I'm sorry, as we have, I wonder if we could, in the last couple of minutes, move into the education questions. You know, what's available and, and who should create for education, that kind of thing. Okay, I'm interested in that. You hear different theories as to who should write programs for school usage. Should it be programmers? Should it be educators? Should it be school teachers? Should it be the students? What do you think? Sue? I think it should be educators, people who know the subject matter. But the average teacher is already overloaded at work, so there should be some kind of support system to help that teacher produce computer-based learning materials, and that may be an instructional designer or a psychologist, but also somewhere along the line you need a good programmer in there as well. You agree, David? I'm of a mixed opinion on this one because I think that uh, I've seen teachers, although overworked, to recognize that part of their essential job is bringing their children to know computers and therefore they're prepared to go that extra mile for it. I also think that we should think about educated programmers and not necessarily educated by the system we have right now. I see. Tori, what thoughts do you have on this? I agree that I think the intent is that we should take educational programming out of the hands, per se, of the technologists. And we should at least share it with the people who have uh, lots of expertise in child development and learning systems. Uh, I think if we had that combination with the technologists in terms of how to bring that design to the to the program itself, then I think that would be the perfect combination, which do we don't have at this present time. Do you think computer programs are likely to replace books? No, because I think they serve they serve absolutely different purposes. Um, books give us a time to reflect. I think computers give us a time to apply and process knowledge. Okay, Lou, I'd like to ask you about user groups. How useful are user groups in choosing and obtaining programs? User groups are probably one of the most useful um, areas for any gain any information or insight into programs for a variety of reasons. The first is that user groups uh, traditionally have a whole program library available of non-commercial software that's available free of charge to its own members. Um, the only requirement would be that a member has to bring along the disc or, or cassette to copy that onto. Um, the other thing is user groups quite regularly uh, review um, application programs that are available in the marketplace and it's a good place to get information about that program. Lou, thank you very much. A good place to end. Gifts and Jim, thank you so much. We'll take a brief pause now. We'll be right back and Jim answer your questions. On Bits and Bytes next week, Billy Van and Lou McGoy will talk about how programs work. You'll learn about CPU, the central processing unit, and the basic operations of repetition and decision. You'll also see how to write your own simple quiz program. That's at 9 p.m. At 9.30, I'll be back with Jim Butterfield and his guests for more hands-on demonstrations and exploration. So next week, watch Bits and Bytes at 9 and join us at 9.30. All right, Jim, we have lots of questions by mail and by phone since our last program. Here's one we have from several registrants who cannot use the software that we've sent out from the Academy and they want hard copies. First of all, what do they mean by hard copy? Okay, well, a hard copy is a printed copy of the program, printed out on a piece of paper so that you can type it into your computer. Hard copy programs can very often be entered into quite a variety of computers because you can simply type it in. You don't have to worry about tape formats or disk formats. All right, can they get it from us? Unfortunately, no. Because of copyright restrictions, the Academy is able to send out hard copy versions of the programs. I should mention for the public, of those who would like to read their programs and study them, that if you do have programs in your machine, you can always look at them and see what the program code is like by typing LIST, L-I-S-T. All right. Several viewers have asked this one. Are there any adjustments I can make to my computer that will keep it running smoothly? Okay, well, your computer isn't like your family car. You don't need to take it in for a job every couple of months or so on, but there are one or two things you can do to keep it running. 
Don't dig around the insides of the computer. There are no moving parts in there and nothing to wear, so leave that alone. But the area where you can do yourself a favor is in the area of cassette tape. The idea here is this. The cassette tapes have a magnetic head to read the information, and those heads can get dirty, and those heads can sometimes get magnetized. The same head cleaners and head demagnetizers that can work on your stereo cassette player will also work on your computer cassette player, and it's a good idea to use those from time to time and keep your cassette in good shape. All right. Now, here's one from several of our registrants and, and one that I'm still asking, Jim. It says, Mr. Butterfield, you skirted the answer on the last program. I still don't know what computer I should buy to get started. I skirted the answer? Heavens no. Well, this one's... The idea here is that you've got to decide what you want. I can't tell you what computer to buy if I don't know what your requirements are. Now, some people say it might be a good idea to buy a small, inexpensive computer and find out about computers. In one case, uh, I told people that if your uh, child wants a computer to try his hand at, then buy an inexpensive one in, in six months or so. Your ch kid will tell you what kind of a computer now he or she is ready for. Now, on the other hand, we really have a question of identifying what you want. You don't just buy a computer because it's expensive or it's glamorous. You buy it because it's something you want to get out of it. Maybe an education, maybe a business use, maybe some other kind of a use, but you must decide. And it's sizing the computer available to your needs that's the important thing. Once again, stay tuned. We're showing users who are actually talking about their applications on the show, and they will tell you what they're using computers for. You can judge for yourself. Is it just as important who I buy from as, as what I buy? Yes, it's very important to uh, at least understand your dealer and have a dealer that maybe will be helpful and informative towards you. You might like to check a number of dealers to find out who seems like the best person to give you information. There are other places where you'll get information on your computer, too. Don't neglect the user groups. If you can find other people around you who have the same computer, they can share their problems with you and you can learn from it. Thanks, Jim. That's all the time we have for this program. Our next program, the topic will be how programs work, programmers and programming. Until then, I'm Jack Livesley with Jim Butterfield, inviting you to join us again on The Academy.